paper lives, mobility, citizenship, and belonging after partition. We have uh, with us for this lecture today Dr. Hemanti Roy, an old friend. Um, she is an associate professor of history at University of Dayton, OU, and she is the author of two books, Partitioned Lives, Refugees, Migrants, Citizens in India, published by the Oxford University Press in 2012, and another book, The Partition of India, published in 2018, again by the OUP. Uh, the topic on which uh, she is speaking today is, of course, very, very important and uh, also very interesting. She has done her major work on the partition, and the lecture that she is going to deliver today is a kind of subtopic of the partition. One of the things that emanates from uh, the partition, of course, it has other <coughs> dimensions as well. She is going to talk about uh, how uh, the passport in the case of India-Pakistan relationship gradually came to mean so much and it has so many implications for citizenship, for uh, people's rights, for their identity and so on and so forth. As we are aware that uh, passports and uh, Many other documentations which are used for identifying citizens for international travel, they are a relatively modern phenomenon. And in the pre-modern societies, you, we rarely had these kind of documents and people were allowed to move relatively freely. But once the modern state uh, came to acquire rigid boundaries, obviously the need for identifying who were the citizens and who were not the citizens, and what kind of controls should be exercised over non-citizens entering uh, your territory became more and more rigid. In the case of India-Pakistan, which were, uh, before 15th August 1947, one country, these uh, acquired uh, another dimension as well because of the, of the history of the manner in which the partition took place and the violence, massive violence that happened at the time of partition and then uh, hostilities and acrimony between India and Pakistan made uh, the question of identity, documentations, etc. all the more important. So, uh, this is what makes uh, the talk by Hemanti Roy all the more interesting. So, uh, without taking any further time, uh, may I now request Himanti to uh, deliver her lecture. Okay. Uh, you must have braved uh, the pollution outside, so special thank you, I really appreciate it. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Dr. Mishra, who, uh, it's a happy coincidence, we were, uh, well, not batchmates, but we were at JNU at the same time, so I know him from before. Uh, and I also wanted to thank uh, Iqbal Ahmed, who uh, helped organize um, the logistics of the talk. Uh, so this is something um, of a kind of preliminary uh, paper. Uh, I have been thinking about uh, identity documents uh, as a way to understand uh, not only the interfaces between uh, citizens and uh, the state, but also as a way to think about uh, the history of mobility of people who are moving. Uh, because that's where one of the particular identity documents that I look at, the Indian passport, both its British as well as its Indian uh, post-colonial version, 
uh, really come into place. And so I hope uh, that once my talk is over uh, in the Q&A uh, to hear from you and, you know, I'm looking for suggestions. Uh, especially in terms of uh, locating the materiality, so locating uh, passports or visas that maybe uh, people might have in their homes uh, from the 1940s or 50s, uh, and that, that would be great. Uh, so just once, who is the person who operates this? Yeah. Uh, so I just do up and down? Okay. So in the era of globalization and increased mobility, government issued documents with photographs, such as passports, driver's licenses, are common travel companions. One cannot board a plane or a train without a government approved ID. In this context, the passport has emerged as the quintessential quintessential uh, 20th century document that guarantees not only entry and exit at a country's borders, but also certifies identity and citizenship. There is now even a passport index which measures a country's international worth in terms of how many countries a specific nation's citizen can travel visa-free. A recent Newsweek article reported that, and I quote, the power of the U.S. passport has fallen behind uh, under President Donald Trump. It noted that the American passports had fallen behind 18 countries in terms of global mobility. And global mobility is judged by how many countries uh, allow holders to visit without applying for a visa. As you can see, uh, India is pretty low in that passport index. The U.S. has now tied for the sixth place with Ireland, Canada, and Malaysia. In recent years, Prime Minister Modi has often declared uh, that the Indian passport is a token of pride and that now, and I quote, the world looks at those with the Indian passport with respect, end quote. And this is primarily um, in speeches that he has given to overseas citizens in uh, Western nations like the UK and the US. The passport as an artifact, its very materiality, is also central to contemporary debates on national sovereignty. The conservatives in the UK have promised that the British passport would return to its original dark blue and gold color from the EU-imposed Burgundy model. As Brandon Lewis, the current immigration minister, noted, this return would, and I quote, restore our national identity and forge a new path for ourselves in the world, end quote. India recently announced that it would color code its passports, blue for regular people and orange for those who require immigration checks. The latter is supposedly to protect vulnerable Indian laborers abroad. This measure came under heavy criticism for its ability to differentiate and its potential for the discrimination of those who are poor and illiterate. It, has, it was abandoned almost immediately after its proposal. The modern passport is a travel document, but also one of a range of documents carried by individuals to prove their identity as individuals and citizens. Possession of such documents allows them, as James Scott has suggested, to be legible to the state. As Scott argues, to know its citizens, the modern states standardized people's surnames, developed registers for births, deaths, marriages, property, conducted censuses and surveyed and mapped lands with the primary motive of appropriation, control, and manipulation. It's easy to agree that paper identities often do not reflect real identities, which remain based on regional, linguistic, religious, social, and kinship practices. On the other hand, it's hard to get away from the promise of documentary identification. They have the potential to be emancipatory. 
In their efforts to recognize their citizens, they can be enabling and confer rights such as rights to vote, rights to property, and on those who can procure such documents. In today's talk, I hope to examine this tension between the promise of and the denial of documentary identification after 1947 through a focus of the emergence of the Indian passport, specifically the Indo-Pak passport. This document, which began its life in October of 1952, became central to the debates on Muslim citizenship in India and Pakistan at a time when such issues were in flux. The Indian passport and visa scheme produced a range of documents that managed the mobility of a far diverse group of Indians than just Muslims and of partition refugees. The Indo-Pak passport scheme, in conjunction with the Foreigners Registration Act of 1946 and the Citizenship of India Bill 1955, and here I only refer to the Citizenship by Registration and Naturalization, uh, these three acts led to the emergence of a particular documentary regime that produced a range of documents such as passports, long-term and short-term visas, emergency certificates, and naturalization certificates, etc. This documentary regime allowed the Indian state to establish its newly minted authority to its mobile citizens and simultaneously established itself as distinct from its colonial predecessor. Moreover, beyond partition migrants, it was the paper lives of the routinely mobile groups, such as married women, minorities, and overseas Indians that led to significant understandings and policy changes on citizenship and belonging. For the purposes of this talk, I'll restrict myself to the first two categories. I've discussed elsewhere that such paper regimes are not new, but borrowed heavily. Is there a problem? It, can that be? Okay. So I've discussed elsewhere that paper regimes were not new, but borrowed heavily from colonial antecedents in British India. After 1947, the British Indian passport was renamed the Commonwealth passport, which marked its holders as British subjects. By July of 1948, India had drafted a new Indian passport, which had two fundamental changes. The description now read India instead of Empire of India, and the head of state was noted as Rashtrapati in Hindi and President in English instead of Governor General of India. The Indian passport was also no longer going to be printed in French. There was a cautionary warning from the officials in the Constituent Assembly. I, I quote, the term India cannot, however, be treated as final even though it has appeared on the passport, until the Constituent Assembly itself has adopted it, end quote. Until then, no definition of nationality or citizenship could be associated with the Indian passport. This document controlled international movement, but special permits controlled the mobility between Portuguese and French territories within India, Citizens of Tibet and Maldives could get travel passes to India, while residents of Nepal and Bhutan were not required to carry any such documents. Kashmiris traveling from Pakistan to their hometowns were required to obtain special permits. Pilgrim passes continued to govern the travel of those Indians who wanted to make the Hajj pilgrimage. But most of the focus at this time was on regulating the massive numbers of migrants crossing each day between the newly created borders of India and Pakistan, both in the East and the West. Both countries quickly developed specific sets of documents to regulate these movements. In July 1948, India adopted a permit system across its western border with Pakistan to curb what it perceived to be the one-way traffic of Muslim refugees. Under the influx, of, influx from Pakistan control ordinance, entry into India would now require a permit. Pakistan followed suit in October with the Pakistan control of entry 
ordinance, claiming the need for internal security. However, there was no permit on the eastern border between India and East Pakistan. The differing policies on the eastern and western borders stemmed from the Indian state's understanding of the partition experience in this region as different and where the eastern migration was viewed as unwarranted and not significant. In its goal to re regulate specific mobility, that is post-partition movement between India and Pakistan, permits discarded the idea of civic credential that was intrinsic in the British Indian passport. However, it continued the requirement of signatures and photographs in order to identify border crosses, and more importantly, violators of permit regulations. Five kinds of permits uh, were issued from diplomatic representatives in India and Pakistan, located in Bombay, Jalandhar, Karachi, and Lahore. In true bureaucratic fashion, these permits were printed in triplicate, bound as booklets, and serially machine numbered. One copy was housed with the issuing authority, another with the superintendent of police at the destination, and the third was given to the border crosser. Both states thus quickly unrolled what was to be an efficient documentary system of regulating migrants. Three things changed the permit regime to a passport regime. The unpopularity of permits, the needs for new jurisdictional measures in line with the Indian Constitution of 1950, and the need to standardize and control migrations on both the eastern and western borders provided the context for the adoption of the passport scheme. The Indo-Pakistan Passport and Visa Scheme in October of 1952 introduced a special India-Pakistan passport that permitted travel only between the two nation states. The general passport for international travel remained a separate travel document. Together, these documents represented the initial steps towards sovereign nationhood in line with international law. It was hoped that a proper passport system could control and inhibit smuggling and better enforce trade regulations between the two countries. However, popular understanding saw them as a singular stopgap measure to curb the ongoing migration of Hindu Bengalis from East Pakistan to India. A cartoon which appeared one day before the start of the scheme showed Nehru drowning in water marked growing West Bengal population while he valiantly tried to stop more water, that is migrants, from pouring through the border wall with a tiny stopper, which is obviously ineffectual, marked passport. And the person you see across the world, uh, wall is Khwaja Najimuddin, who is basically saying, just, just one, more, one more month and then we can enforce this uh, paper wall. From the perspective of Indian officials, routine and hitherto free mobility now came under the scheme's requirement for documenting it. For example, cultivators and petty traders who lived in the borderland, and at this time the borderland was defined as 10 miles on either side of the India-Pakistan border, these borderland citizens were now required to possess an F visa to pursue their livelihoods in this region. To acquire these visas, borderland residents had to submit to the border authorities another set of documents, khetan or rent receipts, certificates from a union board or panchayat president documenting residents, and often certificates from authorities across the border verifying legal trade or labor. These F visas were valid for five years and, and or until the expiry of the holder's passport, at which time the visa holder had to return to the local authorities for renewal. The F visa regulated routine cross-border mobility, but it also inadvertently also provided certain documentary rights, rights of residence that would be guaranteed by the Indian state. These documents also, albeit in a limited form, could act as new forms of legal tender which protected the holders from being identified as infiltrators or of being deported. While F visas restricted the idea of domicile, even while allowing free movement, 
other border crossers did not have such freedoms. For example, members of minority communities in Pakistan could apply for migration or resettlement certificates or even repatriation certificates if they expressed their intention to permanently migrate to India. Indian nationals defined by having residence or family ties in India. So Indian nationals in Pakistan would apply for repatriation certificates that would guarantee a one-off journey back to India. Both the migration certificate and the repatriation certificate guaranteed single border crossings for an entire family. By restricting single journeys for such migrants, the Indian state sought to not only to control their mobility, but also to influence their decision to permanently leave their homeland. This blueprint for documentary order remained limited by rolling timelines, contextual it interpretations of ambiguous policies, and insufficient resources and personnel. For example, confusion arose over the term minority community, which was the basic criteria for migration certificates. Were Hindus and Sikhs in Pakistan the only groups who came under such a rubric, or did it define everyone who was not a Muslim? What about the members of the scheduled castes whom Pakistan claimed were not part of the Hindu community and therefore not minorities? Indian officials had all these questions in mind, and they reasoned that although applicants for migration certificates were primarily Hindus and Sikhs, certificates should be issued to all non-Muslim residents of Pakistan. But this decision raised another dilemma. If all Pakistani non-Muslims were hypothetically eligible for migration certificates, India could potentially be inundated by the entire non-Muslim population of Pakistan. This would defeat the very intention of the scheme. Consequently, Indian authorities decided that migration certificates would not be automatically issued, but would depend on the worth of each application. Low-level bureaucrats and high commissions in Karachi and Dhaka were instructed that, and I quote, facilities for migration should be given in all genuine cases, but should not be available to every member of the minority community, regardless of the merits of the case, end quote. Further, those who had landed property or business in Pakistan were not entitled to procure migration certificates, and I quote, unless there was a danger to their life and a danger to their women folk, end quote. It was clear how applicants were, it was not clear how applicants were to proffer evidence of such danger. What was clear was that India's humanitarian claims had to defer to the economic imperatives of limiting refugee and migrant populations. But what I've also tried to kind of move away from is this kind of understanding that partition migration and uh, the start of the Indo-Pak passport is the only way to kind of understand the policies uh, on not only the control of mobility, but also uh, the policies on how citizenship gets defined. So I want to move on to kind of looking at some individual cases to see how uh, we can kind of shift away a little bit from the partition. Determining the nationality of those seeking to enter and exit the new territories was central to the Indian state's project of implementing its political and bureaucratic power to its new populations. The concerns regarding partition migrants spilled over even to those whose movement had little to do with the event. Here I would like to focus on a few cases that were not engendered by the events of 1947 in order to move away from these kind of large-scale arguments, uh, large-scale migrations and arguments of governmentality. So let me begin with the story of one Dr. Kanwar Mohammad Ashraf. Ashraf was a well-known historian, author, left political activist, and he had been in London for two years in the summer and in the summer of 1950, applied to the Indian authorities there for permission to travel across to Europe, and then permission to return home to Aligarh. In the process, he suddenly found out that he was actually a national without a nation. Was he an Indian or a Pakistani? As far as the Indian officials were concerned, he was partly to blame. 
He had traveled from India to Pakistan in early 1948, had gotten himself arrested in Pakistan, ostensibly for his communist activities, and then exited Pakistan for London. All he had with him was an emergency certificate issued by Pakistani authorities. As the bureaucrats at the Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Home Affairs scrambled into action, their primary concerns were twofold. First, whether he should be allowed to travel to Europe and other countries. Officials feared that as a well-known communist, his tours, would, his tours would surely lead to anti-national speeches and activities detrimental to the political image of the new nation. They noted, and I quote, in view of the violent anti-government attitude of the communists in India, the activities elsewhere in the Far East, it has been our practice to regard communists as belonging to the category of dangerous, and passport facilities for travel abroad are generally not granted to them, end quote. On this ground alone, passport facilities should be denied to Ashraf. That was the conclusion. I would like to point out here that restricting travel of communist dissidents were rooted in colonial procedures, which had used the British Indian passport also to restrict the mobility of such groups. The second concern for the Indian authorities was, for the purposes of my arguments, far more insidious. It related to whether he should be permitted to re-enter India. This concern encompassed a year-long debate on whether he was an Indian national, whether his travel to Pakistan in 1948 in the wake of the partition-related migrations had take, be taken as evidence of his loyalty and evidence of his desire to be a Pakistani national and whether he should be asked to provide documentation to that effect. The Ministry of Home Affairs pointed out that as per rules of being an Indian national, one needed to show documentary proof of domicile. For Ashraf, his Pakistan-issued emergency certificate listed his domicile as Karachi. To be exact, it listed it as Karachi jail. The MHA felt that this could be used as grounds to disavow the claims of Indian nationality. Ashraf was now requesting to travel from the UK, and it could be that he was for all purposes a British national, since the British Nationality Act was also in effect in India and Pakistan. And given his location in Lon London, the authorities argued that that could be a case that could be made. Indian authorities also argued that his application was also the same as someone asking to return from Pakistan to India. In this line of argument, Ashraf should have gotten a permit to return before he left for India, left India. Given that he did not have one, the MHA argued he should not be allowed to return. Luckily for Ashraf, the Indian state was also concerned with fashioning itself as a sole arbitrator, rather than Pakistan or UK, of the documentary life of Ashraf, and decided that he was eligible for a single journey, another emergency certificate. An official memo clearly noted that, and I quote, such a certificate does not constitute legal evidence of the nationality of the holder, end quote. Ashraf's return, as far as the Indian state was concerned, would not resolve the issue of his nationality for which he would have to approach authorities in a separate application. Issues of nationality remained complicated by another group of Indians, married women, especially those who were mobile and hoped to travel internationally. Until 1958, although there was no constitutional restriction, the issue of women's citizenship after marriage became key in the framing of different directives in travel documents between India and Pakistan. The legal norm till that point had been to use the clause of domicile. Domicile here means residence. So the clause of domicile as the determining factor for those women who married across borders. A woman's domicile, as both states understood it, was her husband's domicile, and her citizenship transferred to her husband after marriage. Thus, Indian women who married Pakistani citizens were deemed to have acquired Pakistani citizenship after marriage, and vice versa. 
This understanding was useful to claim Indian or Pakistani citizenship for scores of women, both Hindu and Muslim, who continued to follow the traditional marriage patterns, the only distinction being that these marriages were now viewed as cross-border unions, and they acquired new nationalities upon marriage. However, there were some who questioned such seamless and gendered transitions. Leila Murshid, whose husband had shifted to East Pakistan in 1951 and had acquired Pakistani citizenship that year, approached the Indian authorities for an Indo-Pak passport in order to visit her husband. Her application was denied because, according to the authorities, her husband's Pakistani citizenship immediately made her a Pakistani as well, even though she resided in Calcutta in India. In her letter to concerned authorities, she questioned eloquently, and I quote, is it, the law of Indian, uh, is it the law of India that an Indian woman above the age of 21 years married to an Indian husband must lose her Indian citizenship against her will and volition as soon as her husband subsequent to her marriage acquires another, say, Pakistani citizenship, end quote. Her letters and petitions to various authorities bore fruit a year later when the MEA agreed that she was still an Indian and gave her a limited term one-year passport. More importantly, passport directives changed after this to de-link the domicile of husbands, wives, and children. Clearly, this did not go far enough for some. In the spring of 1957, SKFND published an article in the Lucknow-based newspaper, uh, The Pioneer, which ruffled more than a few bureaucratic feathers. The article, titled Women's Nationality, declared, and I quote, Indian women married to Pakistani husbands are being denied Indian nationality by our state passport authorities. Such women have been refused Indian passports. This is extremely unjust and arbitrary. Marriage is a sacrament and not a crime to be punished with forfeiture of nationality. Forfeiture of nationality is a sentence prescribed for outlaws only, and everybody knows that marriage is no outlawry, end quote. The authorities denied such uh, charges vehemently, even issued a public press note declaring that there was no such discrimination going on. Rather, they pointed out if that such cases did happen, it was because these marriages had taken place before the cutoff date of 26 January 1950, or if the men had migrated to Pakistan before that date. They also pointed out that it was only if the wife intended to settle in Pakistan that she was advised to acquire a Pakistani passport. But if the woman wanted to retain her nationality, then she would be given an Indo-Pak passport, which would allow her to travel temporarily. In a system dependent on proving intent and situating individuals in terms of domicile, the Indo-Pak passport thus provided some temporary relief to those who did not want to make such permanent decisions. Citizenship of married women continued to be tangled with their travel documents, even in the case of the general Indian passport. For example, when Zenith Shustriya married an Iranian citizen, she applied for an Indian passport to travel to Tehran to be with her husband. Like Leila, Zenith perceived the passport to be a travel document, facilitating her exit and entry. However, under Iranian law at the time, non-Iranian women could acquire nationality acquired the nationality of their Iranian husbands and were required to take out an Iranian passport if they wanted to be in Tehran for long. The problem that Zenith faced was a clause in the Indian constitution which declared that anyone voluntarily acquiring the passport of a foreign nation would lose all claims to Indian citizenship. So Zenith was faced with a dilemma, and I quote from the, uh, what the authorities described it as, choosing between her country which she loves and cherishes and her husband, end quote. In Zenith's case, the Indian authorities argued that her requiring to get an Iranian passport was actually not voluntary. So she was given a temporary passport, but Indian authorities cautioned that, and I quote, the possession of two nationalities, namely that of India and Iran, 
would cause considerable con inconvenience and complications in the future. She would be well advised to renounce one of the nationalities, Indian or Iranian, end quote. They, of course, did not elaborate with those com what those complications might be. Clearly, possessing two different passports would violate India's stand on dual nationality. Travel documents such as the Indo-Pak passport and the general India passport, long and short-term visas, etc., guaranteed certain paper rights to their holders, the right to exit and the return to the nation state, and implied others, the right to residence, domicile, and work, the right not to be deported, and in some cases, the right to be naturalized as Indian citizens under subsequent legislations. Mobility itself, after partition, was viewed with suspicion. Choices to cross borders were seen as national and sometimes anti-national acts, and travel became defined as migration. Such refashioning of mobility was possible due to the Indian state's increasing reliance on the emerging documentary regime. Its development was in some ways unscripted and depended on cases such as Zenith and Ashraf as well as those of partition migrants. The implementation of the passport and visa scheme, I would argue, generated an increasing demand for documentation that would attest to the mobility, residence, and domicile of these individuals. For example, the Delhi authorities complained in 1952 uh, that some applicants for the Indo-Pak passport had often, quote unquote, migrated to Pakistan, but such applicants were now contesting official versions saying that these uh, accusations of migration were false. This was primarily, according to the Delhi authorities, was due to the absence of documentary evidence. What could be such paper evidence certifying such journeys which could be proven simply as travel rather than as acts of migration? Permits, passports, visas, according to the MHA, could be the baseline evidence for such migration, as could be witness statements from friends and families of the applicants. In 1959, an MHA bureaucrat declared, just as the police cannot make allegations without reasonable grounds, the mere denial without supporting evidence by the alleged migrants cannot be accepted. They should be able to give details of the places where they had resided during the alleged period of migration, which can, can be got verified through local inhabitants and other witnesses who know them." End quote. For the state, intent on proving that travel was actually migration, which by implication meant that the traveler intended to become a citizen of another country, mostly Pakistani, and thereby not belong to India, the traveler was equally held responsible to prove both his intent and his action. Such proof for the authorities was almost always documentary. In essence, Passports and visas introduced a new notion of documentary identity in a relatively paperless and non-literate society. The booklet guaranteed the right to return to India and consequently implied inclusion within the nation state. Passport identities quickly became nationalized identities and proofs of national allegiance. Non-ownership of these papers or unsuccessful applications for the Indian passport exposed a person to the possibility of being officially marked as an infiltrator or a Pakistani national and often both. It also exposed one to the possibility of deportation and, incar and incarceration. Those denied an Indian passport would then have to acquire a passport of a different country and thereby voluntarily give up the claims towards Indian citizenship. In India, the passport is one of a range of documents that guarantees mobility, but also performs slightly different functions when they are used to restrict rather than permit mobility. Such restrictions are often mediated through pieces of paper, such as curfew passes or border slips. For example, in Kashmir today, the Indian state has been using the former curfew passes to regulate the movement of Kashmiris in terms of where and when they can move. These passes also allow the Indian state to be visible to their citizens. 
by curbing the freedom of movement, which is guaranteed by Article 19 of the Constitution, bearing special conditions, these passes acquire distinct meanings of citizenship and belonging for their holders. We are at a different point in the nation's history when travel documents such as the Overseas Citizenship Card can be used as a tool to restrict the free press and the National Register of Citizens can document the difference between citizen and migrant through the possession of particular documents, some of which were created after the partition. Such efforts have produced, as Arjun Apadurai has recently called, a statism. A statism is one whose citizenship is, exists only through state-sanctioned documents and certificates. As India's tryst with documentary identity continues to increase manifold, thanks to the Aadhaar scheme, the rhetoric here and globally has been one of inclusion, efficiency, and equal access via single ID cards. However, the history of the Indo-Pak passport tells us something different. When it comes to mobility and their regulation, the passport remained contextual and its access unequal, impacting particular groups. It was also the individual and routine travels of Ashraf, Laila, and Zenith that pushed the Indian state to rethink some of its policies and accommodate their petitions in limited ways. I doubt their applications would have received similar outcomes today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hemanti. Um, we are now open to uh, questions and comments. Please be brief and please introduce yourself. Uh, just one query. Uh, I'm Himanshu Roy. I'm senior fellow here at Tinmurti. Uh, what is the criteria to rank the passports? Are you aware of? Yes. Huh. Uh, you mean the Henley Index, the passport index that I was talking yes, about? Index. Yes, so it basically, it's very simple. It's how many countries allow you to go visa-free. So if you have an Indian passport, there are very few countries where you can go visa-free. So Indonesia is one. I think Brazil is just starting a visa-free regime right now. Uh, Bolivia is another one. <laughs> I don't know if you want to go there right now. Uh, but yes, so it's basically, so the top passports are also actually Asian, so Singapore and Japan are the ones which are in number one uh, in the index. But India is, I think, 79. So it's basically whether you, your passport lets you go through the customs and immigration without a visa or not. Uh, Ravi Bhartia, uh, there are two points I wanted to ask you. One, you have mentioned the types of difficulties that uh, people from Pakistan, minorities from Pakistan, uh, you know, face when coming to India. Uh, can you also elaborate about the types of problems which Indians who wanted to go to Pakistan faced in Pakistan? This was one point. The other point was, uh, I know that uh, Indian passports and people holding Indian passports could go to England probably up to 1964 without any visa. And I suppose people from Goa also could go to Portugal uh, without visa. Uh, can you tell me uh, what was the exact date when uh, this uh, condition was, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken away? And what was the main factor for uh, hmm. doing away with this uh, uh, this facility? The free movement. Three, three, four questions. Without three visa. Four. Without visa. Okay. Yes. More questions. I'm Geetika from NNML. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I was just uh, wondering that in mapping this question of mobility and uh, citizenship through the idea of documents. I was thinking if you have come across or if you're examining also the phenomena of counterfeits or duplicates mm -hmm. or fake documents and how, does, how do these two histories kind of, you know, intertwine each other? Great. Thank you. Any more questions? Or like, come, Ashutosh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ashutosh Kumar. I'm fellow here at NML. Uh, I mean, in the context of uh, 
citizenship problem or agency of women. I mean, do you find any difference between the elite women and the subaltern one? Because in some of the cases, what we have found that those who wanted to come to India from Pakistan, they were, you know, asking or demanding something like those women who were elite, not the subaltern one, that I need a bungalow which should be at the this house or the this park or the, in the elite location of that area at the corner or something, something. So if there would be some difference in the context of this citizenship rights or the problems which women were facing in the context of marriage. So, yeah. Can I just ask, so in the 1950s or now? Not now, during the partition. Yeah, okay. 50s to... I see, I see, yeah. okay. You can take the three questions. What is the position of? We'll come to that later. What did you say? I didn't say no, I could Just answer the question. I'll come back to you, sir. I didn't get what you said. Okay. Uh, so let's go with uh, the first uh, question about Indians going to Pakistan. And at, at the time of, you know, the post-partition decade, uh, let's say the first five years, most of the Muslims who were residing in India were going to Pakistan, right? And some of them would take the permit system if they were aware of it, uh, but most of them would just walk over, as in, you know, this was part of the traditional kind of travel. People often had families on both, like both sides of Punjab. It was just Punjab. It hadn't been both sides at that point. There was no restriction from the Pakistani side? So, to walk in, there is really no restriction, but what is happening is, uh, and there are several scholars who have also worked on this have shown, is that when, say, the Muslims whose homes are in India are wanting to return back to their homes, uh, that is when the paper wall goes up. Because if they haven't taken a permit from India, they cannot come back. So what is happening is that a lot of them are then for whatever reason, uh, misinformation, uh, illiteracy, or by volition as well, uh, taking out Pakistani passports to be allowed, because passport becomes a travel document which would then allow them to come back to India. But once they're back in India, what they realize is, and if they've come after 1950, is having a Pakistani passport means you're no longer an uh, Indian citizen, right? As in, that is where the disenfranchisement is happening. I don't really know the exact date when the free visa for the UK stops. I would, and this is something that is, that is part of my larger project on the British Nationality Act that I'm looking at as well. I would think that it may be something to do with what the kind of tide towards the right in the 1960s in the UK where it's trying to restrict Commonwealth migrants, not only from India, but also from the Caribbean. Uh, because till this point, they were all welcome, but from the 1960s, what you see is that there is this kind of anti-immigrant tide that is coming up. But that, that's a great question, and I'll definitely keep it in mind. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact date for this. Uh, my name is Monmoy Basu. I'm, I uh, teach in Delhi University in Hansraj College. So I just wanted to clarify. You said that um, uh, <coughs> the Pakistani nationals were coming to India. I, I don't <coughs> want to call them nationals because as a historian at the time they were, I, so they were uh, They were a fluid, like, uh, okay. Yes, okay. So, um, so people who are coming from Pakistan, uh, who have gone and staying there and who want to come to India, they yes. don't need a passport. Is it? No, they do. I said they did? Yeah. Okay. So from, uh, for, um, they required a permit or a, a passport so to just depends, come and it go? It depends on the time. So after 1952, they require a passport because the Achha. permit is invalid at that So time. not before uh, 1952? No. There so was no passport. There was no passport. And uh, uh, the same thing applied to the Indians also. Yes. So Indians who were going to... Uh, they, they, they were supposed to take a permit before to go, go into Pakistan, yes. 
permit. So they required a permit, but the Everyone people required a permit. Permit. Right. So, not, so, so pa- uh, think of it as so. exit and entry permit. To exit, okay. once you leave India, you need a permit so that you can say, I came from India, so you can come back. Yeah. But to enter Pakistan also, you need a permit. So there's a regime going on of all kinds of documents that... Uh, I understand. It, and this is only at border check posts. <coughs> Remember, this is a really? time when uh, check posts are all just coming up, personnel yes, are coming yes. up. Uh-huh. So you could just walk over and not go through Because then so thing. many migrants were naturally coming. Yes, of yeah. course. And uh, so the problem with Ashraf was that he couldn't... Uh, it, were, it couldn't, uh, they couldn't determine which country, uh, to which country he belongs. Yes. That was his problem. Yes. Whether he was a Pakistani or he yes. was an Indian. As in, they didn't want to. Okay. They didn't want to. Of course, if, he, if you define a country by your, where you have your home, yes. then it's Aligarh. Oh. So since passport at that time was not needed, just a permit, he could have come anywhere. He, could he didn't have, have uh, a permit. He did. Okay. He had nothing. Okay. If I may intervene good. in this, yeah. it happened in a large number of cases when India was partitioned. Many people, they initially migrated to Pakistan from India, thinking that the land of our dreams, the land of the pure, has been created. Therefore, let us migrate. Yes, yes. But uh, within a year or two, they got disillusioned, so they wanted to come back. So sometimes they were themselves not clear about what they wanted to do, whether they wanted to be an Indian or a Pakistani. So obviously then the official term required uh, documents, you know. So it became a problem. Anyway, I'll come to it later. Let her answer the question. Come to it later. Yes. We'll and come to it later. I, I would qualify Ravikant's comments a little later because it's, I'm not entirely sure that is exactly what's going on. But let's uh, go with... Uh, There was a question on counterfeits uh, and forgeries, right? So in terms of the history of that, I do have files which talk about forgeries. It becomes a cottage industry uh, because having access to uh, actual government-issued passports or uh, long-term visas is not something everyone uh, did have in terms of distance, in terms of financial wherewithal. And in terms of time, sometimes you just needed something quickly, and if you did get caught, you could then produce. So there is really the, it appears in the records as, as again, violation of the state's authority. Uh, And I I haven't come across any counterfeit uh, passports physically, of course, and if anyone has one, I won't disclose, and I would love to see one. But... It definitely existed, and it was, uh, the references are that there's a market for it, and there's a cottage industry, and primarily it, it's kind of the rhetoric is about smuggling, because those, those are the people who are seen as the ones who are illegitimately crossing the border and sabotaging the nation states. The migrants themselves were not seen to be the ones using those. It was primarily associated with smugglers. Uh, there was one other question. Yes. So I am not sure I absolutely understand your question, as in you're talking about women who are coming from Pakistan demanding houses in Delhi. Yes. Yes, so... So yes, as in... One of the major, as in both Zenith and Laila are elite women, right? Laila Moshed comes from a very privileged, uh, very well-known, uh, what we call Khandani family in Calcutta. Zenith's father was a member of parliament. So, you know, in terms of the way in which their cases went, and even the fact that she felt that she could actually question the state, right? Laila questions the state, is a sign of a very different kind of location. But even then, I would say, when you look at, say, the files at the Indian archives in the Indian citizenship section, there are thousands of files, right? They're very thin, and they all put, they're all about women getting citizenship, get, becoming Indians, right, by marriage. And most of them will have applications with thumbprints. Right, which also tells me that they are, as in, I don't know if I can use the term subaltern, but they're not elite, right? And 
there is a way in which I think the idea that citizenship by marriage kind of percolated down where these applications are kind of help us kind of read against the grain to say that even subaltern women knew enough if they wanted to gain citizenship of India or Pakistan, they, they could take this path forward, right? Any other question or comment? Yes. Please use the mic. I think I have made it No, no, uh, just use the mic. As I said to you, deserving coffee, sir, a former deserving coffee, sir, I actually came over to India from Rawalpindi in 47. So I actually saw the, the partition mm -hmm. uh, happening before my eyes. Uh, but my question is, in the paper, the, the, this lecture was built as on partition of India. N not about the technicalities of passports and these things. So that's why I came here. I'm so sorry to disappoint. <laughs> I, I thought I would be able to continue. We, we, we well, can, we can uh, talk yeah. about the partition after the QA. I can, I'm, yeah, I'm, I can yeah, put yeah. it this way actually, uh, so much work has been done on partition by now that a historian has to kind of take uh, a smaller a niche area which is related to the partition in some way but doesn't uh, focus on the partition as such. So it's actually a compulsion also and she's a historian of partition only but now she has moved on to an associated area. Mm -hmm. So but uh, yes, yes, of course, you know, we are uh, really sorry to disappoint you. Mm -hmm. Any uh, other question? Can I ask, can I ask another question? Be sure. brief. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> you see, immediately after partition, a lot of people from Punjab used to come to, uh, you know, India, they crossed the borders. But uh, Sindh, people from Sindh, uh, of course, most of them came via ship, ship yes. to Bombay, Bombay and, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, Sindhis, uh, people from Sindh used to c continue to come to India for several years. Yes. And there have been instances where, you know, they have been harassed and, uh, you know, etc., etc. I don't need to go into that. Can you please explain how is it that uh, they, uh, people from Sindh used to come for many years to India, whereas uh, uh, migrants from uh, Punjab didn't come so often? I mean, after a certain stage, they didn't come mm -hmm. uh, to India. Okay, so it could be part of the... So there are many answers to this, and it's, it's complicated, but I'm, and I'm borrowing from uh, my own researches on Bengal but I've read a lot about uh, what's happening uh, in, in the Western Front, if I may call it. So what is, what is happening with the Sindhi ref refugees is not very unique if you compare what is happening in Bengal. So in Bengal, the migrants are coming from East Pakistan up until 1967-68, and in fact, if you want to kind of push it forward, then by 1971 there is another uh, large group coming because of the Bangladeshi uh, War of Independence. Uh, so coming to India was never stopped. What was stopped was one, there was a paper wall, which I, that, that's what I'm kind of trying to say, and again to qualify uh, Ravikant's comments earlier, uh, a lot of people from India went to Pakistan for whatever reason. It could be just the violence, to escape the violence, to find a kind of a majority where they felt safe. And that happened with the Punjabi Hindus and Sikhs as well, from, from the west to the east. But a lot of them are also wanting to come back, to go back, right? And this is where, by 1952, that paper wall comes into place, where you are no longer if you do want to return home, and I do strongly believe, and I would argue that people want to go back to their homes, right? As in, yes, there is a nation state, there is some identification, but after partition, you do want to go back to go back home. No, and but Sindhi did not want to go me, back. Me, yes, absolutely. I, yes, so that is one, and the paper walls, in a certain sense, prevent 
it's a border where there is no border, right? Now, with the Sindhi refugees, again, as I said, there is no <coughs> restriction of coming into India, right? Where there is restriction is the refusal of the Indian state to recognize them as refugees. And that happens with the Bengalis as well as the Sindhis. And the Bengalis are coming in far greater numbers than the Sindhis, right? Now, why do the Punjabis not come anymore is something that it could be because most of them have already come and there were very few compared to Sindhis. Sindhis got, the violence was not as much in Karachi. Uh, there was always a connection. There, there are many answers to that, right? I, I would say that the Punjabis had already, as in the exchange had kind of tapered off by 49. They came in waves and it, it finished. Right. One might add that uh, we are now uh, going to conclude very soon. One might add actually yes, that. Huh? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, if I am not wrong, somewhere in the middle of the lecture you mentioned that there was no such permit system for the eastern yes. borders, and that came from a certain understanding of the partition by the Indian state. So I uh, just, you know, want you to clarify what kind of understanding it is and also the fact that, uh, say, in Assam, for example, there I feel there was some kind of an <coughs> inconsistency between the Indian state's understanding of the partition on the eastern border as, and, say, the uh, Assamese subnationalistic aspirations in its nation's forms which were emerging then. So can you please clarify the no, understanding? second question requires a thesis, uh, but I'll try. So, yes, and I, I make this case every time I give a talk that, you know, when we talk about the partition, and this is for those of you who came for a partition talk, this is my little way. We talk about the partition, the narrative is always dominated by the Punjab experience, right? When we think about the partition in our memory, it is Punjab. And I don't mean it because we are located in Delhi where the partition refugees, the memory is very local, very immediate, and very near. But even if, where, wherever you go, it, you look at the literature, you look at the historical scholarship, the narrative, the normative understanding is Punjab, right? And within Punjab, the narrative is also about large-scale violence, horrific uh, murders, gendered violence, uh, migration, etc. But what was happening at the same time was a partition of Bengal, right? As in Bengal, uh, which has the longest partition border. So India's longest border is with Bangladesh. It's not with uh, Pakistan today. Uh, what is also happening is that in terms of actual numbers, if we expand the timeline from 1947 to 49, instead of looking at only that, if we look at, say, 1947 to 1965, in terms of numbers, the Bengalis are coming far more than the Punjabis, right? If we also look at when the Bengalis are coming and who are coming, we find that 1950 is the date when actually the migration happens. There's a major riot in uh, East Pakistan and in uh, parts of Bihar and West Bengal when you see the major thrust of migration. And it, it's also kind of a two-way migration at that point, but in general, Bengali Muslims do go to East Pakistan, but not all of them. There is very little violence, though in my first book I did make the argument that there is violence, but it's different, it's routine, it's psychological, it's small scale. And the Indian state's understanding of who a partition refugee was very much linked with the idea of violence. Have you suffered enough? Have you suffered enough to gain that recognition of a refugee, right? And in that, the Punjabi refugee came up as yes, and the Bengali refugee came up as no. And in terms of rehabilitation as well, the Punjabi refugee was portrayed in public, uh, publicity documents as this kind of enterprising uh, man who uh, basically again, you know, re rehabilitated himself, whereas the Bengali refugee was lazy, 
always wanted dolls. You send them to the Andamans, they hate it there. You send them to the Dandakaranya, they hate it there. They're always protesting. They don't know anything. So, and it was a kind of co continuous source. So a lot of the policies then, in a certain sense, try to distance themselves. And the argument that I make is that why don't we take the Bengal partition as a normative in terms of this is how partitions happen, and the Punjab one as the aberration. This is how partitions actually don't happen. Right? And, you know. But, yes, I'll answer your second question yes. later. It's <laughs> we continue the discussion over tea because this partition is the subject which uh, calls for endless discussion. No, but, uh, you were saying there are so many people from Bengal are coming. Yes. That's all right. But they didn't require a permit. It is not possible. That so Please sit down. Let us yes. continue they the didn't discussion didn't over tea. Hold on, I'll handle it. Fine. It's okay, it's okay. Yes, so, no, so till 1952 there were no permits because the understanding of the state is that they will go back. They, they, are, they are just here temporarily, they'll just go back. But they... No, then, then there is a passport system, no? Yeah. All right. <coughs> Uh, we had a but I'm agreeing with you ma'am yes I'm not comparing it's the Indian state which is doing it I'm actually saying it should be at an equal footing, but the Indian state doesn't see it that way. Uh, thank you very much. We have had uh, a wonderful presentation and a very good discussion over uh, this subject. Uh, the discussion is, of course, likely to be endless, so we will continue uh, over tea. There are just a few small uh, points that I wish to make. Uh, the distinction that the Hemanti has noted and which we have discussed here between Bengal and Punjab partition is of course a very important distinction. I for one do not think that Punjab uh, partition was an aberration. The fact that Punjab partition was taken much more seriously by the Indian state and by uh, historiography in India, it has a historical background. It was fundamentally different from Bengal partition. It was fundamentally different in one sense, I mean, as you would know, that right before the partition, there was a serious proposal to allow Bengal to remain united. And nobody in their wildest dreams had ever thought that if India and Pakistan are coming up as two separate countries, Punjab can remain united. The religious demography of Punjab was far more sharply divided. There were three distinct communities and Muslims and Sikhs were historically heavily militarized communities and the fact that a la large number of people in the Indian army were recruited from the Punjab made it a militarized zone. Since it was a militarized zone, much more violence was bound